I'm Dr. Carrie Chassels, the Executive Director of Student Affairs at Vancouver Island University. And before we proceed, it's important that I acknowledge and appreciate our presence on the traditional Sunemu First Nations territory. And on behalf of the colloquium organizers, I wish to thank the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Ross McKay, his staff and their support of the colloquium series. I would also like to thank the theater for housing us and providing technical support and the Media Research Lab for filming the event. On the VIU Arts and Humanities webpage for students considering studies in the arts and humanities, Dean McKay recommends reading Why Study the Liberal Arts by Richard Sigurdsson. So I took a look at it. Sigurdsson emphasizes that, and I quote, a liberal arts education is not intended to train you for a specific job, though it does prepare you for the world of work by providing you with an invaluable set of employability skills, including the ability to think for yourself, the skills to communicate effectively, and the capacity for lifelong learning. We live in a fast-paced and ever-changing world driven by innovations in science and technology, changing political boundaries, new understandings of ecology, wellness, human rights, world inequalities, our place in the universe, and the human condition in its many forms and expressions. What the world needs today and for the foreseeable future are creative, thoughtful, and interdisciplinary thinkers who can take on the big social, political, economic, scientific, and environmental questions. Scholars in the arts and humanities develop essential skills for inquisitive, reflective, creative, and integrative thinking and learning. They become the great innovators and problem solvers that advance all of humanity. Our colloquium speaker today exemplifies the tremendous strengths of scholarship in the arts and humanities. As a professor of English, Dr. Ledwell Hunt is going to enlighten our understanding of disordered eating through a feminist lens. The very title of today's colloquium invokes anticipation of concepts that have been explored by medical scientists, psychiatric experts, sociologists, philosophers, nutritionists, naturopaths, spiritualists, marketing strategists, and image experts, among others. I'm looking forward to the insights I'll glean from Dr. Ledwell Hunt's work as the Executive Director of Student Affairs and a loving aunt of juvenile nieces and nephews who are being subjected to overwhelming and often unhealthy body concepts. I'll apply today's learning both in my professional and personal lives. Disordered eating is an important subject for discussion. Just this month, our local newspapers have published stories that highlight the significance, indicators, and impacts of disordered eating. The Nanaimo Daily News reported last week that 3,000 people on Vancouver Island have been diagnosed with an eating disorder, and 10,000 more are symptomatic. Our counselors at VIU have supported numerous students, men, women, transgendered, and genderqueer who are struggling with disordered eating. In its recent series on mental health, the National Post described disordered eating as the most deadly of all mental illnesses with a 10 to 20% mortality rate. The more that we can learn about disordered eating, the better equipped we'll be to develop informed prevention and support strategies. With that anticipation, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Don Thompson, a longtime member of the English Department at Vancouver Island University, to the stage to introduce today's speaker. Good morning. Long time member. It's been, it's been 20 years exactly. And um, I have to say in those 20 years, most of those 20 years, up until just the last couple of years, whenever I mention the word feminism, I tend to get kind of weird expressions on a lot of my students' faces. But I've been very heartened just in the last couple of years because I've noticed what seemed to be the beginnings of a, a, revi a revival or a renaissance especially amongst the young women in my classes. 
what they're talking about doesn't always look like the kind of feminism that opened my mind when I was a student in the 80s. Some of them don't even want to call it feminism. They talk about gender equality. Some of them write about being hesitant to come out as a feminist. But they are talking about it and they're writing about it. They're responding to misogynist posts on Facebook, to rape reports of rape cultures on campuses, and to a political and judicial system that is so broken that it refuses to look at, itsel look at itself in light of an appalling number of missing and murdered Aboriginal women. And Janice Ledwell Hunt is, I think, part of this feminist renaissance. Janice has been teaching in the English and Women's Studies departments at BIU for only the past year and a half. And I don't know if that's a coincidence which, from when I've seen students more interested in these subjects, but um, she's moved to, she moved to Vancouver Island on a whim while completing her PhD dissertation through the University of Alberta. Janice grew up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then ventured increasingly westward to pursue graduate studies and better tree prices for her side gig as a tree planter. Funded through scholarships and grants, Janice has shared her work internationally, most recently in Portugal. Her PhD dissertation, entitled Anorexic Affect, Disordered Eating and the Conative Body, completed just last fall, offers a transdisciplinary feminist reading of anorexia and bulimia, which moves between modernist literature evolutionary biology, animal behavioral studies, deluso spinozist philosophy, material feminisms, and popular culture. Talk about the interdisciplinary issues that, um, that Carrie Chassels was just speaking about. Janice is currently working on turning her dissertation into a book tentatively titled Anorexic Affect, Disordered Eating and Post-Humanism. Beyond this, she has been writing a collection of theoretical essays about her experience as a Canadian tree planter for over a decade. When she's not studying and ac accumulating zombie lore to generate content for a recently introduced English course called Groupthink, Zombies, Belonging, and the Politics of Living Dead, Janice seems to be amassing and then walking giant breed canine companions. In fact, she is currently developing, and I'm looking forward to this, a literature and critical theory course that explores companion species. So please join me in welcoming Janice Ledwell Hunt. Uh, I want to start out by saying thank you for coming. It's so lovely to see you here. I've been excited about this for a very long time. And I want to acknowledge my sense of gratitude for having been invited to give this talk by the um, Colloquium Organizational Committee, and also to the English and Women's Studies departments here um, on the Nanaimo campus and also on the Cowichan campus because I've been here for a year and a half and I've experienced nothing but generosity um, and a really kind of welcoming, inspiring atmosphere. So also thank you to Don for that wonderful introduction. Um, all right, so I want to begin by asking all of you to think about health because I think it's impossible to contemplate illness without first making recourse to the ways that health is used and often misused. By health, I'm not referring to a natural state of equilibrium between bodies and minds, nor am I pointing to a successful type of citizenship. Actually, by asking you to think about health, I'm hoping you can start thinking about a story or more of a narrative exercise. So my question then to you is, how does the story of health work? And I think this is an important question. So here are a couple of the results from just a random Google search on health. Um, and these are the kinds of slides or, or visual representations that come up. I think this was just straight out of Prezi. I searched for health. Okay. Um, so what you're probably noticing is that um, health is always figured as a choice. Uh, so four out of the five, if not six, I'm not good with my numbers right here on my feet, but they all speak to choice. Um, in fact, 
we know, they seem to suggest that we know we're good citizens, and by good I mean responsible subjects, because we make good, and I mean by that responsible choices. And good choices are in fact those that lead us to health. In fact, in many cases these good uh, choices lead us back to health if we've been caught up with kind of other ways of being. But I think that this is a bit of a tautology. And by tautology, I just mean it's sort of circular logic. Um, what tautologies generally do, though, are alert us to the need for different sets of questions. So here we might ask, what is repeatedly framed as healthy? We've got clean food, so cleanliness. We've got exercise, and normally that's accompanied with the notion of fitness. Um, we've got longevity, so choices that add up to a lengthy and thereby somehow better life. Um, energy, I guess energy for doing stuff that is productive, which might be another tautology. Uh, education, so that we know enough or we possess enough knowledge to make these healthier choices. Uh, we've got concepts, I think, of freedom and free will. So this first one, I, I recognize that you can't see it very well, but I'll read it for you. It says, instead of giving myself reasons why I can't, I give myself reasons why I can. Um, we've got the concept of hygiene, I think of sanitation, of sanity, of sustainability, of relationships, sexual and otherwise, that allow for growth, change, and free expression. And let's not forget about safety, because health and safety always go hand in hand, it seems. Um, we've got the concept of comfort, financial, physical, social, sexual. Um, youthful bodies, or rather bodies capable of youthful inflections. Self-motivation, autonomy, self-improvement, self-care or care of the self. Individuality, and I think I might have already said it, but I'll reassert freedom of expression. So my point here is that the project of health has come to be mistaken as self-governing um, in a kind of governmental sort of way. So in the absence of centralized authority making us make healthy choices, we continue to understand that living itself, which we could think of as merely having or being a body, must mean doing what we can to ensure its longevity, that it stays around for a long time. Not only is this disciplined health a personal responsibility, but it's a social responsibility. It's even a civic duty. Um, health is politically, or we might even say neoliberally mobilized as an enactment or express expression of our full potential, of our self-reliance, of our capacity for self-governance, of our heralded ability for self-formation and self-regulation. And all the while, by choosing health, we think we're making personal choices, lifestyle choices. Uh, we think we're affirming possibility, not negating it. We think we're securing our future by virtue of these healthy choices, not limiting the possible manifestations of daily bodily life. But I want to give you an example of how health can operate as a discourse that also forecloses possibility. So I'm an instructor here at VIU, and that generally means that on a daily basis, I don't think there's anything special about VIU in this sense, but it usually when you're an instructor, a professor, on a daily basis, your inbox um, includes emails from students. Sometimes they're texted to you, sometimes they're on your answering machine. And they say something to the effect that I'm really sick and I can't come to class today. Now, around midterm or exam or assignment hand-in days, those kind of, your inbox is generally inundated with these kinds of um, <laughs> moments. But sometimes it's the flu, sometimes it's a broken toe, sometimes it's menstrual cramps, sometimes it's anxiety, to name a few. And I think that these messages are particularly rhetorically effective, which is to say persuasive, if the student adds a statement like, I really don't want to get others sick. Or, I don't think the students around me will appreciate my coughing. Or, I'll be too medicated to contribute usefully to the group. I just really won't function. <laughs> um, and because I'm expertly trained in empathy, as you can tell, <laughs> uh, my response is usually something completely vapid and platitudinal-like. Oh, I'm so sorry you're not feeling well, and I'm glad you're making your health a priority. Your health is far more important than anything else. <laughs> but 
what just happened there? Because I've spent more than a decade thinking about the ways that illness mobilizes us differently. I've written thousands of, of pages that boil down to that thesis in one way or another. I'm certain that sickness can be productive and expository, ex uh, sorry, expository rather, and I'm certain that it can fuel all manners of intellectual and physical breakthroughs. But in those moments, there I am, ventriloquizing neoliberal platitudes about self-care, personal health, and communal, if not civic, responsibility. So what I've done is I've tried to prepare a much better, what I think is a much better, a draft of a much better response to these kinds of emails. And I, I genuinely want to test this on you and see how it might work. You can let me know afterwards, maybe. And I hope you can see me here. Okay. Is that visible? Okay. So, <laughs> here it goes. <laughs> Dear student, and um, you could insert your name here if you're in this audience and you've sent me one of these. Or, <laughs> um, so I'm interested to hear more about your blank, which could be the flu, it could be the broken toe, it could be the menstrual cramps, it could be the anxiety. Um, it's probably important to draw your attention here to the fact that these are all just micro names for categories of deviance that work really troublingly on a macro level. <laughs> Your sense that a healthy body is required for class attendance is something we should probably interrogate or question. In fact, I'd say that coming to class on a day you're broken, and I put that in scare quotes, is the first step to engaging with different patterns of thought. You see, all right, uh, this sense that only healthy bodies can participate in social milieus, like our class, is actually quite damaging. The healthy body as a marker for responsible, conscientious citizenship amounts to an egregious display of one's personal and social responsibility through a fit body, and a fit body only. By fit, I'm not just referring to muscularity, or lung capacity, or heart health. I'm referring to fitness as a quality of fitting into spaces properly and unobtrusively and com comfortably. By fitness, we could refer to the ways that certain qualities are mandated within social spaces. And these qualities generally have to do with making everyone feel perfectly at ease. The problem, though, as I see it, is that dis-ease is really important. I'm not trying to romanticize your illness, although, to be fair, if this is a literature class, we pretty much only read books that are produced or fueled by some kind of illness. <laughs> Um, but by saying that dis-ease is really important, I mean that all of momentum requires disequilibrium. I mean that illness isn't simply the failed underbelly of health, but its characterization as such is in fact the problem. And this characterization isn't innocuous, it's not innocent in any way. Think of who and what fall outside of this regimentation of health. Bodies that take up too much space, bodies that take up too little space, bodies that take up space queerly, bodies with the wrong sorts of protrusions, bodies with the wrong sorts of holes, bodies with the wrong sorts of leaks, bodies with the right sorts of leaks, bodies that move strangely, and bodies that don't move at all. So by way of demonstrating this phenomenon, I've never received an excuse for absence from a student that read something like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't come to class tonight because I'm feeling too healthy. I don't want to infect others in the class with my positive lifestyle choices, my freely expressed opinions, my meticulous hygiene, my youthful, vibrant hue, and my rigidly disciplined yet autonomously, nay, creatively performed self-regulated self-improvements. In short, I think that your attending today's class would be one tiny critical physical limp towards supporting difference and activating an ethical project that doesn't prioritize health. You might, in short, throw a monkey wrench in the machinery of healthism. Hope to see you there, Janice. <laughs> So it'll work? <laughs> Good. Um, I'm still working on it. I'm still <laughs> ironing out the kinks. And I, I mean, I, I'm glad that this has humored you at least a little bit. And I know I'm being flippant here, but usually my flippancy has some kind of function. I hope, anyway. Um, for starters, I think it's critical to keep exposing the way that healthism produced modern, produces modern subjects by curtailing certain diseased expressions of physicality, sexuality, desire, and pleasure. And now I recognize that to call an eating disorder an expression of physicality, sexuality, desire, and pleasure, it probably seems irresponsible. 
Um, but my through line thus far has been to expose the dictates of health that are often synonymous with responsibility, safety, and comfort. Part of what our academic work might take on, in other words, is this sense that good scholarship need necessarily be safe and endowed with disciplinary protocols that foreclose all kinds of cross-pollinations between disciplines or provocations that, in a word, make us feel uneasy or diseased. The sets of behaviors that have been named anorexia and bulimia are fueled by pleasure and desire. I think that only certain sets of questions have been asked about them, and I know that those questions are not the only productive questions worth asking. Now, anorexia as a term, so as a term, it can actually be translated into living without desire, or sometimes it's translated into living without hunger. And bulimia, is the Latin word for ox hunger. Um, so I think that here the clinical naming protocols can teach us something about value and about the relationship between narrative and illness. So first, we might think of the way that psychiatric conditions, disorders, or even diseases are understood by a system of classification under which a set of system, or a set of symptoms rather, repetitive patterns of behavior become criteria for diagnosing what is in this case a nervous, understood as a nervous condition. Um, second, the psychiatric process of diagnosing disorders relies on the distinction between conditions. The Diagnostic Statistics Manual 5 at this point understands that anorexia and bulimia are separate disorders, and we might even say that their naming implies that they're mutually opposed. While anorexia arises out of a woman's lack of hunger or desire, bulimia seems to emerge or is thought to emerge from an excess or overabundance of hunger and desire. Um, my third point is that there's an interestingly vexed relationship between hunger and desire expressed by these names. To eat equals to, sorry, to not eat equals to not desire, whereas to eat equals to give in fully to desire. And I kind of, I want to trouble that um, because I think it's a very limited understanding of desiring. Actually, it's a psychoanalytic understanding of desiring. Um, and in psychoanalysis, we understand desire as that which stems from lack. So the notion is that once we possess, or in this case, eat something, or someone, <laughs> um, we no longer want it, and we move on to wanting the thing that we don't have. Without going into greater depth about psychoanalysis and desire, I'll put it this way. Hunger can quite easily be imagined um, and reimagined as the expression and occasion for desiring. While we can think about hungering as not having or emptying or lacking substance, we can also think of hungering as striving, moving, searching, and being repeatedly made aware of the visceral and bodily voices we would not necessarily connect with this very strange concept of the self. For example, while my stomach growls, I apologize for the disruption. Uh, for the disruption. <laughs> um, I feel embarrassed and I shrink, I kind of shrink away from that circumstance. Whereas when my mouth growls words like it's doing right now, um, this is me talking. These distinctions between individual voices and bodily voices are somewhat arbitrary and again, worth sort of becoming a little bit suspicious of. Fourth, my fourth point, is that this clinical sense that bulimia is the flip side of anorexia is kind of interesting when considering philosopher Gilles Deleuze's critique of the very same phenomenon that has occurred with clinical understandings of sadomasochism. And he, gener uh, he performs this argument in a book called Coldness and Cruelty. And I'm especially talking about this today because I think that yesterday, uh, this wonderful film that you, none of you should see called Fifty Shades of Grey was released. Um, so it seems like it's on the forefront of everyone's imagination. <laughs> Um, and it's a good reminder to read books that actually deal with the subject in an interesting way. Anyway, so Deleuze goes to great lengths to show that sadism and masochism emerge from very separate literary traditions, um, and that our current nomenclature or process of naming is kind of interesting because um, these are psychiatric sort of circumstances or psychiatric conditions that have been named and understood by virtue of literature. So we've got fiction and then we've got the clinical sort of notion of reality that kind of overlap and cohere here. 
Um, but it's also interesting because by Deleuze's account, Massoc is far less red than Desaad. And in other words, S&M or sadomasochism has been misunderstood as one thing or as two sides of the same coin. So I think similarly, there's a really interesting tendency in feminist scholarship on eating disorders to focus exclusively on anorexia, even though bulimia is understood by the same scholarship as the more frequently occurring and more devastating condition than anorexia. Bulimia, if mentioned at all in feminist scholarship, it's kind of just as an afterthought or an aside. In fact, to voice the concerns of one bulimic, um, she, and I'm quoting her here, in treatment, I always felt like an underclass citizen to the anorexics on my ward. While anorexia inspired awe, bulimia inspired only disgust. I want to come back to this statement and this kind of um, distinction between the two, but for now, let me just note that it's something I know from years of research that um, a true anorexic, and I'll put this in scare quotes because I don't like these terms of authenticity, and I don't think there's only one type of anorexia as there's not simply one type of bulimia, um, but a true anorexic is quite rare, just as a true bulimic is quite rare. So self-starving, binging, and purging are all behaviors that occur in cycle and in sequence. While one person might self-starve for years, they'll eventually turn to binging, binging and purging, just as binging and purging is necessarily accompanied by bouts of self-starvation. Um, what this should do, I hope, is illustrate that the clinical practice of naming disorders separately and then treating them as separate is limited. And to my mind, a better model is to, to engage with symptoms more laterally. Uh, just to take an example, autism and anorexia share many similar properties, share many similar expressions and points of overlap, not in their naming, not in what's currently understood as their sites of origin or what we sometimes call their etymologies, where they come from, why they are, um, but in their symptomatologies. Let's call, so instead of symptomatology, we'll just talk about that as an expression for the sake of simplicity. Um, that's not to say that understanding the overlaps between conditions is necessarily a vexed exercise. Um, we can learn quite a bit from it, um, rather than understanding illnesses only in seclusion or vacuum one from the, the other. Um, and my, the final point that I want to make about this is that we might even think of disorders as somewhat creative inventions. Now, I don't mean that someone invented self-starvation, per se. In fact, um, laboratories, or in laboratories, mice and rats, rodents, they've repeatedly shown that they'll run more actively on their wheels when food is restricted. And to turn this into even a more complex science fiction, is what I'd want to call it, the female rodents will perform more wheel turns than the male ones when systematically starved, even when food is reintroduced back into their cage. Um, but in general, they seem to prefer, over time, eventually, the wheel running to the eating. Okay. Um, but this is kind of an aside. <laughs> I'm not saying that self-starvation is an invention. I'm saying that the clinical picture of self-starvers can be approached as, pos um, um, as possessing narrative dimensions and even intertextual dimensions with other illnesses. So when first observed by Richard Morton in 1694, Anorexia seemed derivative, uh, a derivative of tuberculosis, so he was an expert doctor dealing or handling tuberculosis. Morton recorded his observations of skeleton, what he called skeletons clad only with skin, as he said, choosing to pour over books in lieu of dinner plates. When reinvented again in the 19th century by William Gull and Char Charles, Charles uh, I can't try to pronounce the French today, but Charles Le Segu, oh, that's horrid. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so one is in England, the other is in France, and they're both kind of reinventing this disorder simultaneously. I'm sure that they duked it out and were horrible frenemies, but um, this is what I know. Okay, so Lesseg called, uh, William Gall was referring to what he called an alimentary nihilism, and Lesseg called this uh, l'anorexie hysterique, or an, uh, a hysteria of the gastric center. In other words, my point is that illnesses don't occur in vacuums. They're more so creative tableaus or tapestries assembled over time. Um, the here and now properties of anorexia and bulimia are less about skinny skeletons pouring over books and elementary nihilism. Um, they're more about body image and body dysmorphia. 
and many of the horrible ways that patriarchal discourses punitively inscribe women's bodies. But just as this clinical and critical tableau have, has changed the shape or has continues to change shape over time, my sense is that it needs to keep doing so and we need to keep insisting as feminist scholars that it does in fact do so. Um, and I think that this mode of feminist scholarship needs to happen in conversation with biologists and neurologists and philosophers and ethologists and literaticians or literary scholars um, because I, need that, I, I think that ultimately what we need to do is invent different schemas for reading or understanding anorexia and bulimia. Why do I say that this needs to happen? Um, because I'm willing to bet that just about everyone in this room can and would articulate a connection between anorexia nervosa and the mass media, celebrity culture, dieting and fitness industries, women's self-regulation, and kind of punishing or punitive beauty ideals. And I'm not insisting that this is in any way inaccurate information. I think this is hard-won scholarship and it's important scholarship. With feminist contributions, we no longer have a sense of individual sufferers as the exception to perfectly healthy social and material worlds. Um, no, because feminist, is, feminist analysis has shaped our understanding that anorexia partakes in pathological cultural patterns of oppression and social patterns of oppression in widespread and systematic sets of arrangements through which women are taught to take up less space than men. As one anorexic memoirist put it, my anorexia was a form of apology for even having a female body. But I suppose that my point is that the fact that we all know this or that we all think we know this isn't quite enough. Um, because I, while this isn't a passive or a sort of defeatist perspective, I'm not gonna hold my breath for the ends of patriarchy before figuring out how to treat anorexia and bulimia um, more rigorously or more creatively, more experimentally perhaps. Um, to, because I think too much is at stake. And furthermore, I think we're still confronted with the problem of, health, uh, of healthism that I tried to outline in the beginning of this talk. So once cured, what are self-starvers expected to return to? Self-discovery? Um, more affirmative lifestyle choices? An eating order? a repugnance of different forms of desiring and occupying space, a fairly sedimented set of notions that sick, ill, or diseased bodies are pestilent and toxic. I, and I need to ask this one once more. Are they expected to return to an eating disorder? And what on earth is that? Um, what does it look like? How does it manifest? Because I've met very few people who have compelling answers to those questions. So here's what I think is a fairly succinct, uh, su I can't say that word today, succinct quotation by Branka Arsik. She's a feminist literary scholar. Um, she suggests that to call anorexia an eating disorder is to suggest that not only the existence of a phantasmatic or imagined origin, but also of a fantasied order, since it is to insist that there is in fact a proper eating disorder. With the help of Arsik, there are a few shifts, uh, shifts I'm hoping to motivate. The first is a movement away from the lingering taste of healthism um, that lurks in the notion of an eating, eating disorder. Another shift I'm trying to signal is in this talk is one way of understanding dis-ease um, that, that we can move beyond, a, sorry, rather, we can move beyond an understanding of dis-ease by virtue of identifications or diagnoses. Um, this is one very provocative and pertinent way, but I don't think it's the only one. So, if we consider statements like, I am anorexic, I'm a bulimic, I have an eating disorder, I think what you might notice is that there are descriptions of states or states of possession, ownership, they're kind of still or, or yeah, they're still expressions. Um, and we can tweak that, I think, if we move away from these identity categories to talk about their compositions and expressions. So in short, if we make our emphasis on verbs, action words, rather than nouns, states that are what happens when action is seized, I think something different starts to happen. And so I'm gonna try and demonstrate this for you. Um, I am an anorexic versus, I sustain hunger for as long as possible, I experience pleasure when empty, I fidget fidget ceaselessly to keep my body moving. I feel the changing contours of my body with tremendous interest. I prolong the experience of eating tiny meals by chopping, say, a single apple into 48 odd bites. 
I perform exhaustive food math, weighing social interactions, chanced encounters, and carefully cal calculated mealtimes. I devise physical patterns so I don't need to touch food. I find food particles pernicious. I think they'll radically alter my bodily composition even if they're outside of me. I measure the increasingly negative space surrounding my body with the same gestures I would have previously used to count the parts of me most people would deem actually present or actually there. I stuff food in strange spots, including my underwear. I find myself more compelled to hyperactivity and hyperkinesis the less I eat. I flee from the dinner table with its codes of social and elementary conduct. I leave socially ordained eating spaces to wander elsewhere. I do sit-ups in my bed all night instead of sleeping. I find my room differently equipped with potential for activity than I ever did before self-starving. I see color more vibrantly and experience smells more viscerally when I am most hungry. Okay, so another example. I'm a, or, so I'm a bulimic versus I binge purge. I've trained my body to throw up without making a single sound. I put my head where people shit all day. I devise elaborate systems for mapping food that change its function. Rather than eating food in a conditioned over, uh, order governed by health or taste, I ensure that food courses through my body in the exact opposite order I want to see it leave me. I use brightly colored food so that I can mark the success of my purge, rather than mark its nutritional composition. I wander around cities in compulsive hazes, not knowing where I am, what I am, or even sometimes that I am. I experience spatial relations crises while binging. I map public spaces according to convenient bathrooms or corners for purging, or secretive spots where I can purchase enough food to last a family three weeks, which I know I'll devour in, say, a few hours. I find that resting from eating is anathema to my desire. I need to keep moving. I need to keep preventing stillness. So let's look at what occurred in this shift, because I don't think it's a seismic shift. I think it's more of a minor tweak in the exercise of critique and understanding. We've moved away from identifying eating disorders as states, as nouns, or as morbid toxic objects that far too many women possess. Instead, we've unpacked some of the possible acts expressions, movements that prolong and sustain disordered eating. We've moved beyond the typical markers, both diagnostic and symbolic, that characterize eating disorders. And I think it's a really important step to take, um, and one that feminist scholars need to continue taking. Part of what frustrates feminist critique, or some of it anyway, to my mind, is this sense that or anorexia has been turned into a symbol. It's become a sign, a puzzle, a riddle, a palimpsest, a paradox, a metaphor, or if read most generously, it's sometimes been understood as a misguided form of political protest. But I suppose that my plea here is that disordered eating need not mean anything. Why does it have to mean? Why does it need to symbolize? For whom does it need to continue to do this business of representing? I think that the more crucial question is not what does anorexia represent or what can it stand as metaphor for, <laughs> but rather why must anorexia represent anything? So I can alert you to the most pointed ways that anorexia and bulimia continue to be represented and figured as metaphor or signs, and quite often um, paradoxically so. So this is part of this is the image that appeared on the poster for the Arts and Humanities Colloquium series this semester. Um, when asked by the promotional team if I could think up some possible images to represent my talk, I responded with a really abstruse statement about how ultimately self-starvation is unrepresentable and thus should lead us away from questions about representation. But of course I suggested no mirror, God it's so overused, it's a total cliche, and no skinny bodies, they present ethical dilemmas with trigger warnings and all, and also the repeated figuring of eating disorders as thinness is one way to exclude bulimia from the mix, where bodies don't often manifest in quite the same ways. Um, that's to say nothing of what's often called ednos or eating disorders, not otherwise specified, and also binge eating disorder. Uh, but anyway, so no mirrors and no skinny bodies were the two no-no or uh-oh stipulations that I made. Um, and basically what I'm trying to expose here and take myself to task for is that instead of making any useful suggestions, I just told them what they couldn't do, and I think that was probably pretty unkind. 
Um, and I should also say that this whole diatribe about uh, unrepresentability was total posturing on my part. I was trying to conceal, conceal the fact that I had no good answers, so I just turned it into this thing where there can be no good answers at all. Um, but I think the promotional team did a great job <laughs> because we've got a scale that's also a dinner plate. The way I read this image, and I'm interested to know if other, or you, some of you have different interpretations or readings, but is it, it's in terms of its suggestion that weight is a fixed and persistent preoccupation for self-starvers. Where an ordered eater might see meat and potatoes on the plate, or I don't know, spanak pita or beans, <laughs> um, a disordered eater just sees how these meat and potatoes will manifest on the scale. I have to re-say that. So where an ordered eater might see the meat and potatoes on the plate, the disordered eater might just see how these meat and potatoes will manifest on the scale. Because ordered eating probably never includes such thoughts, right? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Actually, what fascinates, fascinates me about this image, chosen to represent a talk about eating disorders, is that it represents a precisely ordered system of exchange, a perfectly ordinary economy, food per weight, cost per bite, consumption per expenditure. And the thing is that eating disorders are actually highly ordered and always misnamed engagements. So I think the promotional team got it right. It can feel at times when studying this material that naming and identifying are even vexed processes. They're strange and stunning ruses that sometimes expose the need for different sorts of questions and methodologies than clinical models and critical scholarship have tended to allow. So I wanna show you a few of these moments. Um, these vexed moments of naming. Um, wait, I jumped the gun. <laughs> Sorry. So if I can locate two predominant explanations of eating disorders in most scholarship, this is how I would map them. One is that there's the recurrent idea that anorexia serves as a metaphor or as a symbol for desirelessness, for lacking desire, for punishing the body and its desires, for attempting to forego bodily pleasure altogether, or even for attempting to disappear or waste away. Um, starving is often understood as a staving off of material existence. And then the second sort of locus is that there's a persistent sense that disordered eaters represent an extreme and obscene miming of Cartesian subjects who experience the body and mind as radically, as two radically discordant poles. So the whole mind-body split um, is understood as the Cartesian divide after Rene Descartes, our famous Enlightenment philosopher. Okay, so let's start with the first poll. Um, I, I suggested earlier that the term anorexia can literally be translated to lacking desire. But this connection between self-starving and, and lacking desire works way beyond clinical naming and, instead, and also informs critical scholarship on eating disorders. It would in fact, or I would in fact, not it, I would confidently challenge any of you as readers to pick up any odd text that mentions eating disorders and not find somewhere the mention of desirelessness, of wanting to live without hungering and desire, or and desiring. And so I wanna show you a passage that's up here and it's from uh, Stephanie Grant's The Passion of Alice, which is a fictional text and is based on the author's own experience in treatment, in an in, in treatment unit for, for anorexia. The anorexic protagonist states, and this is what you have here so you can read along. My favorite cooking metaphor, unfortunate perhaps, applies not reduce, but clarify. I know exactly what I look like without hyperbole. Every inch of skin, every muscle, each bone. I see where and how they connect. I can name the tendons and joints. I finger the cartilage. When I eat, I follow the food as it digests, watching the lump of carrot or rice cake diminish until finally elimination. So, Alice's favorite cooking metaphor is, I think, quite remarkable here. In culinary terms, the process of reduction is to take a substance and to liter you literally make it take up less space, thereby intensifying its flavors. To clarify, however, is to take a solid and make it liquid in order to understand its component parts. So eventually the cook will choose which parts to retain and which parts to remove. 
To clarify is, in other words, to change the properties of a substance, to alter its surface area, and to expose its constituent parts. Differently put, it is to change a substance's interaction with space and environment, equipping it with different capacities and different possibilities for engagement. Now, if we take Alice's shift and apply it to self-starvation, we might recognize that anorexia is frequently figured as wasting away, as systematically disappearing, as becoming less vi uh, visible, and ultimately as reducing the spaces that one's body takes up. But what about clarification here? Why is this Alice's favorite cooking metaphor? Look at the way she describes her body in the passage. It's not in terms of disappearing or reducing. She's illustrating altered surface, uh, surfaces. Newly emergent joints, bones, muscles, and tendons. In fact, her digestive tract becomes a surface too. When starving, she seems to be able to feel the peristaltic process more readily, the inside outside of her digestive tract meeting with and moving food matter through her system. This description, it's very tactile. It also seems to be about a process of renaming her erogenous zones. The part where she fingers her cartilage seems to make arousal really, really clear. <laughs> so I guess I wanna pose, and so this is in no way exceptional um, in terms of uh, memoirs that have been published from women who um, are either trying to fictionalize the process of uh, suffering and then recovering from disordered eating or who are, um, remembering uh, a very real accounts. So my questions to you, and I guess maybe they're rhetorical in this case, but desirelessness, really? Detachment? Disembodiment? Okay, so number two here. Uh, the other persistent feminist understanding of anorexic is that they're the perfect Cartesian subjects. This is to say that anorexia has been read as a rather poignant splitting of body from mind, as an attempt to dematerialize, to live without a body. Now, to simplify, this is a feminist understanding uh, of eating disorders because in the Cartesian split, mind is always masculine and feminine is always wieldy and feminized as a space. By extension, anorexic women have been understood as trying to erase their bodies completely because women's bodies have long been stigmatized as filthy, leaky, repugnant, monstrous, abject, terrifying, unclean, and straight up crazy. The anorexic speaker I quoted earlier in this talk who suggested that her anorexia was a form of apology for her female body comes again to mind here. Um, but also, This is, uh, these are a series of passages from Maria Hornbacher's Pulitzer Prize winning memoir, Wasted. Um, and she deals with her, uh, her process of engaging with both anorexic and uh, bulimic mod modalities. Um, so Wasted su suggests initially anyway, something along similar lines. Hornbacher writes that in eating disorders, body and mind fall apart from each other. And it's in this fissure that an eating disorder may fester and thrive. The splitting of the body and mind causing eating, eating disorders is not psychotic, but in fact, it's the history of Western culture made manifest. We claim a loss of appetite, she writes, a most sacred physicality, superwomen who've been who have conquered the feminine realm of the material and finally gained access to the masculine realm of the mind. Bodies are treated like wayward women who have to be shown who's boss, even if it means slapping them around a little. Okay, so if we turn to a later passage in that text though, it's fairly um, close to the first passage that I gave you there or that I read out. Hornbacher also writes, I perfected the art of the silent puke. No hack, no gag, just bend over and mentally will the food back up. Sometimes I don't even have to bend. So I think we need to pause on these passages for just a second. Um, and again, this is by no means a singular instance. Um, because when Hornbacher's book moves away from trying to assert what anorexia or bulimia is or happens to be what they are, to try and articulate what it does, something very interesting happens. One way to read puking silently is as mind over matter. But I think that's a very narrow interpretation because another more obvious reading is that her thoughts materialize her body in discord with the human organism's normal capacities. 
If you can stand over a toilet and will your food, which is supposed to move through your mouth, into your digestive canal, into your intestines, and out through the other end, then I don't think we're dealing with a mind-body split so much as a mind-body connection. Hornbacher describes a bulimic process by which thought, thoughts emerge differently and perhaps counter and they counterintuitively equip her body. We might even say that her digestive organs have learned or have become capable of thought in the sense that they start to operate against what seems natural and healthful um, and in, against what seems the normal operations of the peristaltic or digestive process. In another instance, and this is the third passage quoted for you here, Hornbacher writes that there's a very simple, inevitable thing that happens to a person who's starving. When you're not eating enough, your thinking process changes. Nothing is the same. You want things to taste intense. You're high as a kite, sleepless, full of frenetic, unstable energy, and the heightened intensity of experience that eating disorders initially induce. At first, everything tastes and smells intense. Tactile experience is intense. Your own drive and energy themselves are intense and focused. You begin to rely on the feeling of hunger. I was suddenly deeply, passionately interested in everything, she writes. I couldn't stop thinking. I woke up in the night, heart pounding and head spinning with thoughts. I turned on my light and began to plot things on notepads. Now, to recall a slide from earlier, or a statement that I made earlier, this version of disordered eating looks a little bit like the 1694 Richard, Mor uh, Richard Morton version of the skeleton clad with skin pouring over books rather than a dinner plate. Um, but also we might look at the repetition of the word intense. Look at the strange energetic momentum that Hornbacher describes. Look at how she describes the ecstasies, or another way of pointing to ecstasies is to break it up and call it an ecstasis, or an ex-stillness um, that hunger produces. This is not about disembodiment. It's not about dis, uh, dis, uh, or, sorry, detachment from the matter of bodies. It's about physical arousal by virtue of hunger of different patterns of thought and touch and energy. It isn't, in, or sorry, isn't it interesting then that Hornbacher, like so many other feminist writers, insists upon explaining anorexic experience as a splitting between body and mind, and yet demonstrating precisely the opposite in, in their writing. To come back to one of my earlier claims about the relative lack of scholarship on eating disorders that deals with bulimia in any sort of a sustained way, here I'm going to venture a guess as to why. Anorexia, at first glance, seems to fit more conveniently into interpretations that rely on control, discipline, ascesis, disembodiment, and what I've kind of characterized uh, quickly as the Cartesian divide. But bulimia? Plain and simply, it doesn't. Gorging and puking, binging and purging, there's no way that these practices can have anything to do with sensory detachments, immateriality, or fantasies about bodilessness. And I suspect that the relative second-class citizenry of bulimia, uh, bulimia in feminist scholarship, despite its more frequent diagnosis and occurrence than anorexia, is an awfully good clue. What it, does it do as a clue? I think it anticipates and invites new ways of reading. The through line of this talk is that we need to follow different types of feminist thought experiments to understand disordered eating and dis-ease. And I think it's fair to say that the Cartesian mind-body split is only one way of explaining lived experience or subject formation or ways of being. And there are others, I promise. Um, so if these interrogative lines or these, these through lines don't get us closer to an understanding of the sensory events that occasion disordered eating, then what will? And rarely, uh, this is, yeah, this is a rare occurrence, but I actually have a very good, a very concrete, and some might even call it a very practical answer. Um, and it, it's in the realm of literature, philosophy, and feminist philosophy. I wasn't joking, I do think those are practical. Um, I don't think that literature and philosophy are necessarily equipped with the power of healing us, per se, but I think they are exercises in exposure and invention. They expose and some might call this a practice of diagnosis, new or sometimes very old diseases, while also inventing new postures, new ailments, new expressions, new conceptual vocabularies, and new symptoms. To put it simply, literature and philosophy should make us feel pretty disillusioned with, let's say, the dictates of health, while at the same time inventing vital forms of living 
and desiring that can repattern existence or recombine symptoms to invent different disorders and diseases. It's important for me to signal um, closure here by stating that I'm aware of the potential risks in my talk. I know that there's a fine balance between exposing the limitations of health and romanticizing sickness as a viable alternative. In a nutshell though, what I've attempted to do here is suggest that health need not only have one manifestation. So long life, safety, identity, stasis, balance, hygiene, fitness, and discipline, I think they're only one sort of, uh, well, they're one node um, of possible manifestations of vitality. Vital health could also encompass stuff like risk, experimentation, pleasure, disequilibrium, desire, community, conversation, connection, ecstasy, and ecstasis. In finishing that list with the concept of ecstasis, I want to show one final literary passage. And this one's from Samuel Beckett's um, wonderful novel, Watt. Uh, Rather than confronting what I've been referring to as disordered eating, Beckett challenges the eating order, or what he refers to as the eating ordinary. Um, so here's what he writes. The ordinary person eats a meal, then rests from eating for a space. Then eats again, then rests again. 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 And in this way, now eating and now resting from eating, he deals with the difficult problem of hunger. A few pages later in this text, too, there's a wonderful character who we could think of as kind of a at least in connection with clinical pictures of bulimia. And she eats an onion, and then she eats a peppermint. And she eats an onion, and then a peppermint. And an onion, and then a peppermint, because she can't choose which one to end on. So she just needs to keep eating. So you should all read it. There you go, <laughs> if you haven't already. Um, but I want to single, or signal, rather, two points about this wonderful passage. The first is that instead of approaching ordered eating um, or ordinary eaters with a morally infused discourse about health and productivity, which we often see happening. Beckett's take on the eating ordinary or the eating order is simply that it requires sequences of movement and rest. I'll just leave that one hanging for a sec because my second point is that this, pa um, this passage is what Beckett calls, or he, he refers to the difficult problem of hunger. And I'm interested in that. Why is hunger a problem? Um, it's prevented, he suggests, by submitting the organism to a predictable, regular, and repetitive calculation of time, space, movement, and rest. If we're able to say that eating, followed by resting, holding food matter in reserve, facilitating digestive ease, and of course, storing food for nutritive and productive purposes, are some of the symptoms, and it's worth noting that Beckett refers to these as symptoms, of ordinary eating or an eating order, then Beckett here begs an interesting question. How do we account for the relations of movement and rest uncovered by those who approach the difficult problem of hunger outside of this particular cycle? Throughout Watt and elsewhere in his literature, Beckett often addresses the same behaviors we've come to call anorexia and bulimia and binge eating disorder as well. He offers a single diagnostic criteria, criteria for these eating patterns. It has to do with prolonging X stasis. Differently put, um, it's about avoiding these particular types of stillness, rest, storage, and accumulation. What I'm trying to say is that choosing not to stop, never to remain still, never to save for tomorrow, and never to accumulate for a set future strike me as really compelling expressions of a different type of subject than what discourses of health and ordered eating tend to produce. These types of movements without repose also strike me as, a symptoma as, as symptomatic of anorexia and bulimia. Just as much as, say, an investment in patriarchally imposed standards of female beauty. And I think an intellectually curious and ethically engaged feminist politics should leave no rock unturned when it comes to deciphering how we might differently treat disordered eaters. That's how feminism can help. <laughs> So I'm coming back and I'm answering my title by keeping on the move, especially if that move allows for the continued invention of different expressions of dis-ease that will expose our reliance on the narrow dictates of health. I'm going to really and truly end by attempting to come full circle. I propose the possibility that my talk risks performing pro-anorexic or pro what's 
um, often in, uh, read as pro-Anna or pro-Mia positions in an attempt to defy healthism. And I don't take, like, I, I'm not jesting here, I don't take these concerns lightly at all. I've thought a long time about them. Um, but just as with healthy bodies, I think it's important to work past the concept of the concept of health in scholarship. Rather than producing work that values longevity, safety, balance, identity, stasis, and rigid discipline, I'd rather produce work that engages risk, experimentation, provocation, disequilibrium, and yes, ex stasis. Um, this, I think, is a politics and an ethics that borrows from dis-ease rather than trying to ensure comfort. 